This segment of JTV News is brought to you by Clarence Thomas Limited, Infinite Solutions, and Caribbean Sellers. Former Civil and Tourism Minister Philip J. Pear has called on regional governments to have a united approach on the future of Liat. The former minister was speaking in the wake of statements by Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez that the air carrier will cut services to unprofitable routes. The former minister says that such a move would be a backward step to the regional integration, especially following the advent of the OECS free movement of people. What On Thursday, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, said Liat was seriously considering no longer flying unprofitable routes. Dr. Gonzalez believes the Antigua-based airline is disadvantaged in competition with other airlines for market share in the region. The Vincentian Prime Minister added, if Caribbean governments don't help to fund those potential eliminated routes, the airline will just cut them. However, former tourism minister Philip J. Pierre says such a move would be a retrogressive step for regional travel. Liat is a special case. Liat has been working in the region for years. Liat, if Liat has to operate on purely, on, on purely venture, uh, as a purely um, commercial venture, then we have to decide that. So I think it's a position that the, the region must take Liat seriously and must sit down and discuss it and come to an agreement. The former tourism minister further added that such a move would stifle the recently implemented OECS free movement of people, which began on August 1st. Pierre admits more airlines are under financial pressure and Liat is no exception. The airline is also hampered by its high fares. Pierre believes are caused by high taxes as opposed to Liat's management. He pointed out, for instance, that while St. Lucia continues to subsidize international airlines through marketing support, they don't do the same for Liat. Regional governments, he added, must take a conclusive decision on the future of the airline. Any impediment to free travel or any increase in the cost of travel will definitely hurt our movement of people. But again, if you examine the, the, the profile of a Liat ticket, you'll find a lot of it is taxes. In St. Lucia, we just added another $90 in, in terms of taxes. So it, it, it's not a situation you can look at in isolation. Um, you, you have to look at the, 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 the profile of taxes. You have to look at it. Whether, whether governments may want to make a sacrifice as far as taxes are concerned. So it's something that we have, we have to discuss and we have to take a position. Three shareholder governments, namely Antigua, St. Vincent and Barbados, own a majority stake and pay more to sustain the airline. Liat has in the past called on other regional governments to provide financial assistance to the airline in order to ensure tourist arrivals to their respective countries. Sarah Peter, HDS News, Channel 4. The Cayman Islands government came under fire again in the latest Auditor General's report that criticizes how the government secures contracts and questions government transparency. The new report provides additional details that reinforce the need to tighten up procedures for the management of government procurement. Among the areas of concern listed by Auditor General Alastair were the way a contract was set up for Cayman's national CCTV program and financial regulations broken with the contract to host Jazz Fest 2009. Auditor General Alastair Swarbrick and his staff looked closely at the $2 million contract awarded to the Security Center for the first phase of the national CCTV program. Days before the contract was awarded, Cabinet held up the decision for six weeks. For a system that was critical to the government's initiative to fight crime, we believe this delay was unnecessary and, unavoidable, uh, and avoidable. Another red flag for the Auditor General was an advance payment equal to a quarter of the overall value of the contract. Normally in these sort of contracts you would you expect the company themselves delivering the service to have the financing in place to be able to deliver it and then you they bill you for the services. Mr. Swarbrick says because government lacks clear guidelines, it's unclear whether such a payment was warranted. But otherwise, the audit found the tender's process followed the rules. We have no evidence of any collusion between any parties. The Auditor General also looked at Jazz Fest 2009 and the $1.2 million contract to BET Event Productions. There's not really much to say apart from the fact it didn't follow the contracting process. The contract did not go out to tender, and as such, there was no oversight by the Central Tenders Committee. 
The company started work four months before a contract was signed with the Department of Tourism. The AG's office also noted that advance payments were significant. We are continuing to look at the ongoing processes, significant uh, procurements and tenders at this moment in time. The AG signaling that other government contracts not done by the book could soon come to light. Ben Mead, Cayman 27. Meanwhile, Cayman Islands Premier Makiva Bush lashed out at the Auditor General's office. The Premier says the performance of government for the last fiscal year shows prudent and responsible management of finances and efforts on the part of the Auditor General to show otherwise are unfounded. He said they are trying to keep his government from getting the Cayman Islands finances back on track. Governor of the Cayman Islands, Duncan Taylor, also issued a response to the Auditor General's report. While he says he welcomes the report, he is concerned about the Premier's reaction. The Governor says, in his view, it is unacceptable to respond by making personal attacks on the Auditor General and his staff. He said the Premier has made very serious accusations against the Auditor General, but he has seen no evidence to justify them. The Governor also says he has spoken to Premier Makiva Bush and urged him to show restraint. There was widespread devastation reported on several southern islands in the Bahamas after Hurricane Irene finally passed through the archipelago on Thursday, August 25th. The storm left roads impassable, some residents homeless, and others in desperate need of electricity and water. Our first stop was here in Arthurstown, Cat Island, where all you could see was devastation. Trees uprooted, debris all over the road, and a few structures damaged. Prime Minister Hubert Ingram greeted the contingent and some residents at the Arthur's Town Cat Island Airport while he was headed to Abaco. I thought that Cat Island, which is going to be um, a hard hit in terms of the reconnection of its electrical supply, mm -hmm. uh, would be a place I'd come to first. Um, and uh, also Grand Key in my constituency and Green Tail Key, which are, Green Tail Key has also been badly hit, not terribly so. Mm -hmm. Um, not devastated like the Guardian said this morning. Right, there um, were there's, no, that. There's, there's no place in the Bahamas that's devastated. The storm's strong surface waves has made road transportation next to impossible. There is no power or water in most of the settlement, and residents like Leslie Bannister and Louise Seymour Fraser, who bore the brunt of the hurricane, just happen to live on the ocean. This, well, this is not the first time it happened here. We're used to this. The winds were howling and the, um, it was like a monster on the outside. Minister, how concerned are you for the Arthur's Town Police Station here in Cat Island? Well, they had a lot of water damage. They said that they, they abandoned it around 4 a.m. when the water got high. Uh, as you can see, they showed where the water level was. And so obviously there's a lot of water damage that will have to be taken care of. We, we got a report through the police command centre that was set up at the Paul Parkinson Centre and, and the various police officers. Uh, officers in charge reported throughout throughout the storm and so we have a fairly good assessment and and we'll continue to provide whatever relief we need to do so. From Ken Island we ventured south to Acklands and we're now in Lovely Bay where reports had surfaced that 90% of the settlement was destroyed by Hurricane Irene. Well there definitely was some devastation here as this house we understand a three-bedroom house owned by a gentleman is now totally destroyed. As Ackland's residents cope with the aftermath of Hurricane Irene, native and former PLP cabinet minister Loftus Roker never saw anything like this storm. The wind, I'm sure it was over 120 miles when it passed Delectable Bay, anyway. And um, it's, it's, it's like it was going on for a week. <laughs> it just seemed like the hurricane would never stop. We then hopped over to Anagua in the south where a welcome committee greeted the contingent. Royal Bahamas Defense Force Southern Command officers helped the entire community prepare for the hurricane's arrival. While well, a day after the storm, commanding officer of the Southern Command, Sub-Lieutenant Samantha Hart, maintains all is well. The most um, Anagua experience was tropical storm-like conditions. It was after the storm had passed that the weather really deteriorated, but it didn't escalate no more to, um, to hurricane-like conditions. Restoring electricity is a primary concern for Long Island residents. Deadman's Key was our final stop, and we witnessed Bahamas Electricity Corporation crews repairing a downed power line. Long Island residents are grateful, though, that the storm is gone. The storm damaged our roof, and I see most of all here in Long Island, the, the, the roofs of homes were damaged very badly. 
whenever it's at my house, I witness shingles come off my roof so solid, and then I see plywood started falling from back of my house. And I think this one's the worst thing they ever had. Altavis Mannings, ZNS News. The Trinidad and Tobago government is to seek an extension on the state of emergency that was imposed on the island over a week ago. Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa has announced that the state of emergency in Trinidad and Tobago will be extended with reduced curfew hours. The Prime Minister, speaking at a function in South Trinidad on Monday, said that her five-member coalition, People's Partnership Government, will be tabling a motion in Parliament on Friday to seek the extension of the state of emergency and the curfew that has so far been used to detain more than 800 people, including nearly 300 gang members and leaders. Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Vasesa says her government will seek to extend the state of emergency on TNT but will reduce the curfew hours when Parliament convenes on Friday. She made the announcement while commissioning a water project at Temple Street Diggity Trace Penal to allow 168 residents to get pipe on water for the very first time. Saying that the state of emergency has been a success so far with the arrest of over 800 people, the Prime Minister says the security forces still require additional time to complete their work. And I know that you're worried what will happen when the state of emergency ends. If it is, some people are saying that the criminals are waiting to take revenge and they'll come out for you and a, a lot will take place. Let me assure you we have plans in place to deal with after the state of emergency. And we are also considering and indeed we will extend the state of emergency. But given the criticism and complaints regarding the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. hours of curfew, the Prime Minister says this too will be addressed. She adds that there will be long-term measures to deter people away from a life of crime, including social programs. But in the meantime, Mrs. Poussaint Bessesse is paying tribute to those charged with the responsibility of keeping the country safe. Referring to officers who have been working wrong the clock during the state of emergency, the Prime Minister is applauding their hard work and sacrifice. This is the first time in a very, very long time that we can report that not a life has been lost at the hands of criminal elements in our country. The majority of reports have been, as I say, very positive. They have conducted themselves with courtesy towards the population in most cases, and um, they ought to be commended for that. It's a very hard time for all of us, but it's also a very good time for all of us because we can sleep safer in our beds when the night comes. Meantime, the Prime Minister says as a mother and grandmother, she would like to meet the 14-year-old girl who posted a hate video on YouTube. She wants to find out why the girl would have done something like that. For CNC3, I'm Melissa Williams. Jamaica's Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, Olivia Grange, has been discussing possible areas of cooperation between the governments of Jamaica and South Korea. Minister Grange met with her South Korean counterpart to discuss the deepening of the friendship between the two countries while providing opportunities for their citizens. She said she believed both countries could share knowledge and expertise in sports and culture, particularly in the areas of athlete development, coaching and the use of technology. Grange said she was anticipating a new level of people-to-people -people exchanges and trade in sports and cultural goods between South Koreans and Jamaicans arising from the discussions. The Youth, Sports and Culture Minister said Korea was a strategically important country which offered tremendous possibilities for the promotion of Jamaican sports, music and culture as well as the development of mutually beneficial business linkages. While in South Korea, Minister Grange is also meeting with Korean sports and business leaders. This is Walter Barrett for JTV News.